This is Florida Gulf Coast University. Tonight we're doing Australia and New Zealand. The reason I'm starting with New Zealand first, their wines are a lot more delicate. New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs have a real unique character about them. You know, the ones we tasted from the Loire Valley were kind of crisp and they had a mineral undertone to them. Well, the ones from New Zealand have a real particular identity about them. Hey, what, would you do me a favor? Walk in there, there's an ice bin around the corner. Pluck the bottle of wine out of the ice bin. This is a 2009 Sauvignon Blanc from Marlborough. Tell me what you smell. Uh-uh. It's a pear. I smell pear. Grapefruit. Grapefruit. Does anybody smell grapefruit? A hallmark of a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. If you're putting together a wine list, shame on you if you don't have at least one, if not two of these on there, because they are that popular. Even if you don't like it, even if you're on the fence about it, this is a home run. Anybody remember what the classic two combinations for Pinot Noir flavors are? Remember there's the cherry cola, or you have the forest pork, and you can see your finger through it, and you hold it up to the white background. You can see some real delicate uh, kind of colors coming out of it. Pinot Noir is one of those really funny grapes. It looks seemingly light, but it can pack an enormous amount of flavor and intensity. Let's go to Australia. Water is a whole lot more precious in Australia. Think about trying to grow grapes in Death Valley. That seems like a pretty tall order, you know? But yet they did. And they did it because they were smart enough to bring in the right kind of irrigation. The little grapes are getting hotter and hotter and hotter. At the very precise moment when the grapes are about as stressed as they could ever possibly be, they turn on the irrigation. It produces a really incredible level of brightness and a lot of sugars in the wines, which translate into a lot of alcohol. If there's anything the Australian wines are famous for, it's big, intense wines with some really enormous amounts of alcohol. You do the honors. This first wine we're tasting is from one of the big wineries, Penfolds. This is a very food-oriented kind of Riesling. This is something that really cries out for a big plate of noodles or something that has some richness to it. Wait, wait! Who's your final grade? Huh? Oh, yeah, there's the tall one. <laughs> Just a sip. <laughs> The first Australian wine that really got anybody's attention, Grange Hermitage. Most of these wines are really big and rich and thick and powerful. They have a lot of oomph to them. Talk is cheap. Here's what I want to do. We're going to start out with two different Cabernets. Wild Shiraz, or Syrah, is the most widely planted and most widely known of the red wines in Australia. Cabernet Sauvignon is a fairly close second. Like it or not, that Marcus Phillips was a really iconic wine. It was something that you don't forget. I mean, you taste something that big and that powerful, and you're going, wow. I mean, you're going to remember that one for a while. I want to try an experiment. I'm not going to tell you what this is. I want you to tell me what it is. Ooh, it is a Cabernet. Out of the areas that we've studied, where does Cabernet grow well? Napa. Napa. This is a really good expression of Napa Valley fruit. See, it's got structure, and the fruit is up front. It drinks well right out of the gate. Now, I want you to think about the Australian wines that we were tasting, and now you're tasting this Napa Valley Cabernet. Which one do you think would work better on a wine list? Which one do you think would work better for the clientele that you all deal with on a regular basis? On to the wine that made Australia Famous or infamous, depending on your point of view. This is Richard Hamilton, Shiraz from McLaren Vale, and this is called Gumpers. This is a 2005 vintage, and the alcohol content is 14.5%. Um, it's one of those wines that you're either going to really like or really not like. So, let's play the game. What kind of food do you think this would go well with? It really mean something big and rich like a lamb or a really, you know, hearty grilled steak? Since Australia grows so much lamb, 
For those of you like me who love the taste of lamb, it's a fairly strong flavored uh, meat. You need something really big and powerful in the wine department to stand up to that. You pour a little Pinot Noir with that, and the Pinot Noir is just going to get obliterated. This wine would stand up to that real well. It also works real well for stews, and it's a winter weight kind of wine, so it shares a lot of the same attributes as the Syrah from the Northern Rhone, but it's just a different style. I don't think you'd ever confuse this with something that was made by Jean-Louis Schaub up in Hermitage. You have to understand the mindset of your, your guests or have enough diversity on the wine list. What do you think of Australian and New Zealand wines? You like them? Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you think you could put them on a wine list and sell them through? Okay. So I think we've done something good here.